Um, think about what the Democrats want to do. Step one, defund the police. Democrats here in Congress and Democrat mayors around the country demonizing, demoralizing our law enforcement officers and actually defunding police to the tune of over a billion dollars last year in, in all our major cities. And what's the result of that? Crime is up in every major city. Step two, release violent offenders from our prisons. Last year, Chairman Nadler introduced a bill to pay states and localities to empty their prisons and jails. The bill called for the release of violent offenders from state prisons and local jails. Inmates were only deemed ineligible for release if they did, quote, not pose a risk of serious imminent injury to a reasonably identified person. In other words, it was okay to release inmates as long as they didn't pose an immediate risk to a specific individual. And now step three. Now the third part. Take away guns from law-abiding Americans so they can't defend themselves. This hearing today is, and the numerous bills introduced on our, by our Democrat colleagues make clear that they want to disarm law-abiding American citizens by depriving them of their constitutional rights. And none of these bills would have actually prevented any recent mass shooting. The, the chairman of the full committee just said in California, what I think he said 21 cases where they had extreme protection orders, where they took someone's firearms from them. And he said that may have prevented crime. May have. We don't know. But what we do know is 21 citizens were denied their Second Amendment liberties by a proceeding where they couldn't even attend. Because that's what these red flag laws, these extreme protection orders do. The model legislation that the chairman's talking about pays states to set up a system where anyone can go to a court and say, I don't think so-and-so should have a firearm. There's a hearing where so-and-so, the one accused, the one who's going to lose their firearm, they don't even get to show up. It's ex parte hearing. They don't even get to show up. Then they take their firearm, and then they have to, as a, to, they have to go to court to get their right back, even though there was no proceeding where they could attend in the first place. And the standard for all this is lower, a lower standard, reasonable standard. This is dangerous path they want to go down. So I look forward to hearing from our witnesses, particularly the Republican witness. I am nervous about all the legislation being talked about on the other side. I hope we understand that the Second Amendment is right next to the first because it's pretty darn important. Madam Chair, I yield back. Gentleman from Ohio is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Madam Speaker, we all condemn violence against people based on their race. In America, no one should live in fear that they will be a victim of a crime based on their beliefs the color of their skin, or the country in which they were born. We've seen reports of violence directed at Asian Americans increase recently in some places around our country. While the perpetrators of these violent acts must be held accountable, we have serious concerns about some aspects of this legislation and the process behind moving it forward. For instance, the legislation sets up ambiguous hotlines for people to report anything they find troubling. These hotlines are separate from traditional law enforcement reporting mechanisms, such as calling 911 or your local police department's non-emergency line. And they could enable anyone to report anything that that individual may find offensive. All crimes should be reported, investigated by law enforcement, and prosecuted. Telling the public that criminal complaints shouldn't be reported to law enforcement, but instead to a new unrelated state office, creates unnecessary confusion and could harm public safety. In addition, this bill establishes online reporting for complaints about, quote, incidents. But, of course, the bill doesn't specify what an incident is. No definition at all. This means, essentially, that we are asking state governments to act as speech police and creates a precedent that, it could, that could extend to any manner of things someone may deem offensive. We were hopeful that there could be a meaningful discussion and input on this bill. But the chairman pulled the bill from our scheduled markup and Judiciary Committee last month preventing Republicans from offering any amendments. Republicans had a number that we would have ensured that a uh, number of amendments that would have ensured that the reporting hotlines were focused on actual criminal conduct and not random citizen complaints. Finally, it's important to note that the Democrats have attempted to blame President Trump for this rise in violence against Asian Americans. But the facts tell an entirely different story. This violence, by and large, is happening in Democrat-controlled cities, many of which interestingly enough, have defunded their police departments. For example, New York City saw a 223% increase in reported Asian American hate crimes while defunding their police over a billion dollars. 
San Francisco saw a 140% increase in reported Asian American hate crimes while defunding their police by $120 million. Los Angeles, 80% increase in reported anti-Asian hate crime uh, while defunding their police $175 million. One report found that nearly 60% of the reported hate crime incidents from March of 2020 to February of 2021, the past year, were from these two states, California and New York. Sort of begs the obvious question. Maybe if we weren't defunding the police, if these uh, Democrat-controlled cities weren't defunding the police, we would not have the rise in incidents and the rise in hate crime for Asian Americans. Money wasn't taken from police, and we were allowed to do their, and they were allowed to do their jobs. We could probably, we would probably be in an entirely different position. With that, Madam uh, Speaker, I reserve the balance of our time.